Lately, it seems that we are getting more and more confused about what a church actually is. So let's take some time to set the record straight. Church is not a building, though a building can be used by a church. Church is not a denomination, though a set of beliefs should be important to a church. Church is not about Sunday, though a church should not forsake meeting together. Church is not about one person or personality, though every church should be pastored. And church is not about size or growth, though every church is called to make disciples. So don't think of church as an address or a location, but rather think of church as mobile and on the move. Don't think of church as something built or planted, but rather think of church as something deployed. Don't think of church as where you are for an hour each week, but rather what you are every day of the week, because the church is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Feet shouldn't sit still. Hands shouldn't be idle. Feet go. Hands do. This is the church. Church isn't what you're sitting through right now, because you are the church. Now go and be the church. Keep shining. Oh my goodness, he's beating them up. All right, let's let's all stand. Today, today we have a huge, a long, very lengthy, very lengthy call to worship, all right? Let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Lord, these words are familiar to us. The, Lord, we think of them often. Lord, we are able to quote most of the psalm. At least we could one time when folks made us to learn it. But we thank you, Lord, for its truths, that you are our shepherd. You are watching over us right now as your sheep. You know all about us. You know where we've been, where we're going, that we've gone astray. But you, Lord Jesus, died for our sin. On you was laid the iniquity of all of us. So, Lord, you love us with an everlasting love. Your sheep hear your voice, and you know them, and you give them eternal life. And no one is able to pluck them out of your hand. Your Father, who is greater than all, gave them to you, and no one is able to pluck them out of your Father's hand. You and your Father are one. So, Lord, we rejoice today that the Lord is my shepherd. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Jay, take it away. Standing on the promises of God. Put our hands together. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King. Through eternal ages, let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, of shall and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Yes, I'm standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises, standing on the promise I cannot fail, standing on the promises I cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear, by the living word, by the living word of God I shall breathe. Standing on the promises of God. Yes, I'm standing. 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 Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing. Standing. I'm standing on the promise. Standing on the promise. Christ the Lord. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's overcoming daily, overcoming daily with the Spirit. Standing on the promises of God, yes, I'm standing, standing, standing. On the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises.
promises of sing the last verse standing on the promises of Christ not fall every moment to the spirit as my all in all standing on the front amen standing 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 on the promises of god my savior standing standing i'm standing on the promise let's sing it again i'm standing i'm standing 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 on the promises of god my savior standing standing i'm standing on the promises of god and his promises are yea and amen Men of faith, rise up. Men of faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong when you feel weak in your brokenness complete. Shout to the north and the south. Sing to the east and the west. Jesus Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, women of the truth. Rise up, women of the truth. Stand and sing to broken hearts. Who can know the healing power of our awesome King of love? Come on, shout to the Lord. south sing to the east and the west jesus savior to all lord of heaven shout to the north we will shout to the north and the south we will sing to the east and the west jesus savior to all lord of heaven we've been through fire we've been through by the power of his name we've fallen deeper in love with you you burn the truth on our land we will shout to the north and the south we will sing to the east and the west jesus savior to all church with broken wings rise up church with broken wings fill this place with songs again of our God who reigns on high by his grace again we'll fly shout to the north shout to the north and the south sing to the east and the west
You may be seated. As you're getting seated, we want to make sure that everyone got their very own Calvary Chapel bulletin today. So if you didn't get one, if you'll slip up your hand, in it is a lot of great information, special information. In it, it talks about our upcoming vacation, number one, family picnic, just a week away. So you need to sign up for that. It also talks about our Men of Impact meeting on May 28th, uh, Memorial Day weekend. You'll want to grab that. It also, if you're a guest day, first time, first time in a long time maybe, it has a, a, a place to play to, to let us know that you're, you're here and uh, a place with your name and your phone, etc. But uh, we encourage you to grab that. Jay? Yes, sir. I'm going to go shut my, 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 uh, my tablet off. Why don't you lead them in a welcome song? What's today's welcome song? House of the Lord, Pastor. Amen. Oh, House of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> there is food in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Spiritual food, too. Amen. Let's all stand and sing with Jay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know where Jay's mind goes automatically. You may be seated if you're not already. Welcome to Calvary. If you didn't hear that from us, we're excited that you're here. And we're really, really asking God to touch all of our hearts, our lives, our minds in the next few hours. Because, um, you know, we're going to preach for a long time and all that stuff. I would never do that to any you, Pastor Paul. Really? Amen, brother. Yeah. You brought a blanket and a pillow? I'm already staying three services. Yeah. I'll stay for four. <laughs> wow. wow. Kind of scary, huh? <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good man. So um, I want to congratulate our ladies for an amazing ladies meeting yesterday. Had a great time. A lot of, a lot of women here today uh, or, or were there yesterday. They had a great time, and we're really grateful for that. Um, we continue to have many opportunities to minister in our community. Uh, minister to the police, to the fire department, to just about any, anything that moves. And we're very, 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 very grateful uh, for that. But we're also grateful to have Pastor Paul Schooling back to read our scripture today. Pastor Schooling, it's all yours. Thanks, Pastor. It's good to be back. You know, and, uh, Pastor, you know, you are really blessed to have such an accomplished woman as Deb. I am. Preaching to the women. I am. I am. She's, I hear nothing but amazing things. I know nothing but amazing things. <laughs> from her. From her. From her. <laughs> Good morning, Calvary. Would you stand with me as we read scripture? We're going to read 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16. And it is good to be back. It's good. We're, so, you know, I was, we're gone for, for two Sundays. And somebody said, I missed you for four Sundays. Well... <laughs> I guess, I guess, I didn't make into much of an impression two other Sundays. Wow, you're that powerful. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good to be back. Okay, First Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I lay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress for the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in his flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels. Proclaimed among the nations, believed in the world, taken up in glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord. I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord here at Calvary where we put such a high count on prayer. Oh, Lord, much prayer is needed. May we be on our knees for this nation. May we be on our knees for the changing events that take place all around us. May we be on our knees for this neighborhood. May we be on our knees for our family, our friends. Lord, we pray this morning for the tragic, tragic events that took place up in Buffalo. Lord, with the great loss of life with this mass shooting, 13 shot, 10 dead, another senseless, senseless, act of violence. Lord, we know there are so many things going on around us that almost encourage these things to happen. But we pray, Lord God, that you would stand in the gap. We pray, Lord God, that you would use us as prayer warriors to stand in the gap. And may we uphold our families, our city, our nation. Lift up our hands in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we glorify you in our actions and our deeds. In your holy, mighty, powerful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our Father everlasting. 
blessed, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceive in Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe our judge and our defender, our judge and our defender, suffered and crucified, forgiveness is in you, descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated. the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe. I believe in you. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name. Let's sing that again. I believe in God. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Jesus. And he is our king. And he is the only God. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not 
God depend by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and the bad, you are on your throne. You are God. You're the only God. You're the only God whose power none can contend. You're the only God whose name and praise never end. You're the only God who's worthy of anything we can give. Because you are God. That's just the way it is. That's all sensing. You are God alone. You are God alone. From before time, you are on your throne. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad. what you are. You're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You are God alone. Some before time. You're on the throne. You are on the throne. be seated. <laughs> you were going to get seated whether I gave you permission or not, weren't you? So we continue our series today on letting the church be the church. And as I have been thinking over the last days, months, about the church, I cannot help but be brought to the, 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 the conclusion that uh, it is really only by the grace of God that I find myself pastoring a church. When I first started uh, out in school, I wanted to be a youth pastor because I thought the most boring thing in the world to be would be a pastor of a church. 
like by far the most boring thing. And uh, during a summer uh, of study at Word of Life Bible Institute, two men came into town uh, to teach us about counseling. One was a guy named Dave Wurtzen. The other guy was John White. And when they talked about their lives as pastors of a church, I thought, oh my goodness, that's what I would, would, would love to do if God would let me do it. Being involved in a community, being involved in helping people's lives get, get, get straightened out, being involved in uh, helping the, the, the community as a whole, I thought, man, I, I'd love to do that. And then I went off to Liberty University from there. Uh, this, is, this past uh, May 10th was the 40th anniversary of my graduation from Liberty. You know, yeah, that's, <laughs> it doesn't seem like yesterday, but it doesn't seem like 40 years. And on there, I, I studied under Jerry Falwell. Well, Jerry Falwell didn't teach the classes. He pastored Thomas Road Baptist Church. And really, that's where I learned how to be involved in a community. Because Thomas Road Baptist Church is up to its neck in its community. And I thought, my goodness, that's, that's what I would love to do. So if you, you wonder sometimes, why do we do what we do? Why are we involved in all these things? Why are we... Even, well, surely we, we hope and pray it's God who's leading us. But please also understand that there are people who have modeled that before us. And their model is, is what I, I've chosen to adopt, and I hope this church will always have moving forward. We, we've been grateful in that, in some ways, the church that we work with in Cuba has adopted our model. They're involved in their local school. <laughs> In Cuba. Um, so um, I say all that to say the local church is where it's at. And when we begin to talk today about the church, we're going to talk about its leadership and its structure, which is not the most exciting thing we're going to talk about, but it may be the most important. And when you think of organization and structure of a church, you may say to yourself, why? Can't the church just be the church, just everybody love each other, everybody do what they're supposed to do, et cetera, et cetera? Well, in reality, that's not what happens. <laughs> a church without organization is a church that's in trouble. In the book of Titus, the first chapter and the fifth verse, Paul is writing to Pastor Titus, and he says to Pastor Titus, this is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I direct you. Put in order is what he's saying, or put what remains in order. Put what, what remains out of order into order. That Greek word is epiortho. Now, it means to set something in order. You already know the word ortho. What does an orthodontist do? He straightens your teeth. What does an orthopedic surgeon do? Straightens your bones. <laughs> so what Paul is telling Titus is we need, to, we need to straighten out what's happening in Crete. It needs some organization. It needs to be set in, in order. The truth is a church without organization will limp along. A church without a form of organization, strong leadership, strong structure will limp along. Having said that, a church with too much organization suffocates. You know, if, if you need six committees, four approvals from seven boards to change the color of the toilet paper in the bathroom, probably not a good thing, right? You're with me so far. Well, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy are writing, they're servants, they're writing back to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Remember, saints are the believers, they're not uh, people who are more holy than other people. Uh, and he's writing not just to them, but to the overseers and the deacons. So there seems to be this two groups of people, overseers and and deacons. But if, one of the questions that you might ask is, 
Why, why, when we read the Bible, are all the elders men? Why are they all men? What's up with that? And, and Paul says this really terse thing, right? In 1 Timothy 2.12, I don't permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. You go, yo, dude, what's up with that? Shh, pastors, pastor, Paul had some issues, didn't he? Um, well, first of all, let me just say that when you look at this text, people come at it very differently. There are some people who say, well, that was back in Paul's day. But things changed. So that's no longer true today. Other people say, well, Paul had a lot of personal problems with women. So, you know, we can't be listening to what Paul said regarding women. Other people say, well, Paul maybe had good reason to say this to Timothy at Ephesus, but maybe it's only an Ephesus thing. And other people say, well, it's in the Scriptures. It's, it's, it's what it is. It's what it is. These two views are broken up into two segments in Christianity. These are big words. I hope you came with a cup of coffee. Egalitarianism is a movement based on a theological view that not only are all people equal before God in their personhood, but there is no gender-based limitations of what functions or roles each can fulfill in their home, the church, and society. Meaning, women and men can equally do everything. They're the same. And what did Paul say? Now, Paul said this in around 49 AD. He says, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew or what? Greek. There's neither slave or free. Ooh, what does he say next? There's neither what? Male or female. For all are one in Christ. So Paul seems to affirm here that everyone is equal in the eyes of God. And we believe that's true. Doesn't matter whether you're slave or free, Jew or Greek. Doesn't matter your nationality, your status, or your gender. All are equal in God's eyes. The second view is called complementarianism. It's a little easier to say than egalitarianism. You don't know how late I was up last night practicing that word. <laughs> it holds the theological view that men and women are created equal in their being and personhood. They're created to complement each other by a different roles in life and particularly in church. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, some people get nervous about that word helper. We won't take the time to look at it, but if you look at Psalm 33, verse 10, that word helper is used of God. The Lord is my helper. So in this text, in Genesis, the author of Genesis, Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is not saying a woman is less than a man. Otherwise, God is less than a man because God is called man's what? Helper. Fit form has the idea of the idea of complementing. The woman complements the man, the man complements the woman. They're different, yet equal. They're not the same, but equal. Paul wrote both passages, Galatians, before he wrote 1 Timothy. Some would say his argument is cultural and only for today. We need to ask ourselves what he grounds, as directed by the Holy Spirit, his argument on. What is Paul saying is the basis for his argument that a woman has to have a certain role in the church. What is the basis for his argument? Is it cultural or is it something more? Let me show you. Do you have a second? You guys going anywhere? Okay. So turn with me to the book. Of, I didn't mean to do this. But turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Verse 3. I'll put this on the screen for the next group. 
But look at Acts 16. The services will not be exactly the same. Uh, Acts 16.3, it's an interesting, interesting uh, uh, verse. It says, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. So what did he do? He took him and what? Circumcised him. And all the men said, ow, oh, because of the Jews who were in their places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. That is an illustration of something that's cultural. Paul wanted Timothy to have full access to the Jewish communities that he was going to minister to. So what did he do? He made sure that Timothy got circumcised so that everyone who knew that his dad was a Greek, that is a non-Jew, would not flip out that Timothy was in a temple or in a synagogue. That's cultural. Does Paul give a reason for why women are to have one role in the church and men are to have the other role? Well, let's listen to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He says, Adam, remember, we read verse 12, right? So what comes after 12? 13 and 14. That's called the context. It says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Paul refers to two things, the order of creation and the order of the fall for his rationale, for his reasoning, for the different roles of women and men in the church. Is the order of creation cultural? No. Is the order of the fall cultural? No. Well, why did God make men and women this way so this is the way it works? That I don't know. So why should men be pushed toward leadership and women not? When I read this passage, I find this very, very interesting, this, this text, 1 Timothy 2.8. The Apostle Paul, remember, same context, right before he talks about uh, the fact that the women are not going to have the role as the leaders in the church. He said, I desire then that in every place, who should pray? Lifting holy hands without anger and questioning. Who does he put responsible for the prayer ministry of the church? Men. Let me ask you again. Who does he put responsible for the prayer ministry of the church? Men. Wow. It is my opinion. This isn't from heaven. This is my opinion. It is my opinion that if you give men an opportunity to back off and not lead, they will what? Back off and not lead. So Paul and God, knowing that, push men to the forefront and say, you guys got to lead. Well, we don't want to lead. That's tough. This is your gig. Now, that doesn't mean women don't have substantial roles in the church. That doesn't mean women are not important to the church. Oh, my goodness, where would the church be without women? But it means in the role of elder, the role of the overseers, that role is to be the man's. Now, I understand many people disagree with me, and I will not get in a fist fight with you over that because if you're a woman, you probably beat me because I'm not that quick. But I will say it's what the Scriptures teach. And the argument for it is not based on culture, but on the order of the fall and the order of creation. If you want to see it in a similar way, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, like 35 through 37. But I know I've got to work on now the ministry of church leadership. Paul begins this section by saying, the saying is trustworthy, it's faithful. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, this is a faithful saying. This, is a, this phrase, faithful saying, is found throughout the pastoral epistles. If anyone aspires for the office of bishop, you go, what? Bishop? What's a bishop? Well, please note that the idea of aspiring for the office of bishop is voluntary. Anyone aspiring for it is oregeo. It means to stretch oneself out in order to touch or grasp something. It's also multifaceted. 
The word bishop is used with a couple of other words. It's used with the word elder, pastor, and bishop. You say, Pastor Dave, I'm very confused about this. Because sometimes, sometimes I go by a church and it says, Bishop so-and-so is the pastor here. Is he the bishop or the pastor? Or my friends are Episcopalian and there's a bishop over them and then there's a priest in every church. What is this? Or the Catholic Church has archbishops and then it has a pope. What is all of this? Well, because of all of this, things get very, very complicated for you and I. Biblically speaking, it's not complicated. It's very simple. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. Who was Peter? He was supposedly the first pope. <laughs> but he says that the individuals he's writing to, the leaders, are to shepherd the flock. That word shepherd is the same word as pastor. The word shepherd is the same word as what? Pastor. Exercising the oversight. The word oversight is the same word as bishop. The pastor oversees. Oh, by the way, I don't have 1 Peter 5, 1 here. Peter is writing to the elders. So to the elders, he says, you are to pastor as an overseer. Pastor, overseer, and elder are the same person. The pastor slash elder speaks of the maturity of the person. The shepherd slash pastor speaks of the heart or care for the person. An overseer speaks of the work of the person. Three descriptions of one office. The hierarchy that we see is very fanciful. And I'm not going to fight people over it. It's just not what we see in the Bible. So my question to you going forward is, who are the real bishops? The guys with the hats or these cool cats? <laughs> we had the day I just opened it up and I'd let you ask me a million questions because I know they're in your head. But I, I have to lay out, biblically speaking, as we're going to talk about the church, who, who, who's the leaders and Why? And why don't, we, you know, why don't we have elder, overseer, bishop, pastor, uh, evangelist, prophet on the sign on the front? These are also Holy Spirit appointed and church affirmed. In Acts 20, 28, it, it says to watch over the flock that the, over, that the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of. And it's a multitask. It, it involves both leading and feeding and interceding. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, the church at um, Jerusalem ordains some deacons so that the pastors, the elders, the apostles at that time could devote themselves to two things, the word and what? Prayer. Prayer. Actually, it's the other way around, prayer and the word. And 1 Timothy 5.17 speaks of the ruling that occurs by these pastors. But there's not only here these, these, the, these uh, duties, here's the qualifications. If anyone wants to be a pastor, he desires a noble task. Desires, he has a very strong desire for a good work, an excellent occupation. It is necessary, therefore, because of the nature of this ministry, that the individual have the following qualifications. A good testimony in his personal life. 1 Timothy 3.2 says, Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, uh, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, 
not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. In general, the overseer is to be blameless, not open to censor, censure. Like in 1 Timothy 5, 7, it commands these, it says to Timothy, command these things as well so that you may be without reproach. Not, there's, not, there's nothing in that person's life where someone can point and say, you know, you're great in church, but you're dishonest in business. Or you're this and this and this. In specific, here's what it means to be blameless. Literally, it says a one woman man. Now, some people have said that, well, this person can never be divorced. The the text literally says one woman, man. I take that to mean not that the person has never been divorced, but that the person is a one woman man. I know a lot of guys who've never been divorced who are not one woman men. I know a lot of guys who are not divorced um, who, who, who have not had affairs, who are not one woman men. That person must be a one woman kind of man. Clear headed. Says in Titus 2 2 that the older men are to be sober minded. That's what it means sober minded. Self control, curbing one's desires. Respectful. That's the, from the Greek word kosmios. We get our word cosmetology from. It means somebody who's well arranged, seemingly modest, hospitable. They must love strangers. Generous to strangers. First Peter 4 9 says we're to be showing hospitality to one another without grumbling. <laughs> able to teach. They, teaching doesn't have to be their gift, but they need to be able to teach, be skillful in their teaching. 2 Timothy 2.24 reminds us, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, but the Lord's servant must be able to teach. And then not drunken, not given to wine. Now I will tell you, I don't drink. But I understand when Jesus turned the water into wine, he didn't make welches. The Greek word for wine is not Welchesis. But I don't drink. This particular says, text says, not drunken. If you just read the headlines, or just read four lines in, of all the Hillsong controversies that have occurred in the last year, you will find the, 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 the idea of alcohol in almost every one of them. Why? Because when people drink, they have problems. And there are very few people who are able to curb when, and able to say when they're going to stop. There are people there. I don't, don't misunderstand me. But they're very few. For some reason, it, it, it kind of it works a little bit along ethnic lines. You say, Pastor Dave, that's, that's racial. It's not. <laughs> I am Irish. My last name is Watson. We don't drink a glass of wine. We drink a bottle of wine. We don't drink a beer. We drink a case of beers. So I don't drink. It has saved me a lot of money. An overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick weapon or tempered or a drunkard, one who tarries long at the drink. Not a bully, but yielding. Not contentious or or quarrelsome. Making rooms for, for others. Disagreeing without being disagreeable. Not brawling. Someone who abstains from fighting. You do not want an elder who's looking for a fight. Not covetous. Not loving money. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of what? All kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through with many pangs. And then a good testimony in his home life. 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, he must manage his own household how? Well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? 
The requirement is simple. Manage your own house. That word, manage, means prostomy. It means lead the house belonging to you. Rightly. No room for blame. Having the children in obedience. If someone is a pastor and they have kids, an elder, and they have kids who aren't out of the house, they have the obligation of having those kids to be respectful, obedient, the way, the way Titus says to it, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. The kids aren't wild. The rationale is, if you don't know how to rule your own house, lead your own house, how can you lead, how can you take care of the church of God? Remember, Leaders are to keep watch, elders are to keep watch over the souls of their kids as well as the souls of the congregation. And then a good testimony in his outside life. He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up, I love this word, with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he might not fall into disgrace and into the snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 5.22 says, Do not hastily lay hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. <laughs> it says don't hastily lay hands on anyone. What does that mean? That doesn't mean don't choke anyone. It means don't ordain anyone hastily especially if they're new Christians. That person will fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So not a new Christian, a neophyte. What will happen to a neophyte who comes to faith and gets elevated too quickly? They'll be puffed up. I love this word. It's the Greek word typhoon. It's like typhoon. They'll be filled with smoke. They'll be inflated. And they'll fall into the same Condemnation of the devil. What happened to the devil? He fell from his position because of his pride. What will happen to someone if they're a neophyte and they're ordained too early? They'll fall from their position. They'll fall. Like those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And that individual also could fall into the snare of the devil. Now, it is obligatory also, it says here, for them to possess a good witness. We get our word martyr from. From the outside. From the outside. For years, one of our elders here was a man named Gene Vaccaro. And uh, Gene and I would play golf together with the colonel, as he called him. Gene was in the Army Reserves, and the colonel was the colonel. So we're about to tee off one morning, and Gene goes to get something. The colonel had no reason to say this in the world. Dean, Gene was one of our elders. He looked right at me and said, Pastor, for what it's worth, Gene Vaccaro teaches me what it means to be a Christian. No other words. Gene came back. The colonel didn't say anything else. We teed off, and we... Proceeded to see how the colonel needed Jesus. Uh, <laughs> and Gene and I were struggling to walk with him. But, but that testimony from the outside that you are different. Tells us in 1 Thess 4.12, wants us to walk properly before outsiders. Colossians 4.5, we're to walk in wisdom toward them outside. And otherwise, you'll have defamation. You'll have public reproach. And you'll fall into the snare of the devil. Now, as we bring this particular section to a close, the next words are 1 Timothy 3.8. And it says, deacons, likewise. There are two offices in the church, biblically speaking. The elders, who are also bishops and pastors, one title, or three titles, one office. And then there are deacons. You can search the Bible through and through. You'll find no treasurer of the church. You'll find no trustees 
of the church. So why do we have trustees? Well, because legally in the state of New York, you have to have trustees. <laughs> and on boards, you need, you know, first chair, second chair. Those are boards. You need a constitution. You need all of that. But biblically speaking, we need deacons and elders. And if you read Titus, you won't see any mention of deacons. But what do we do with all this? Well, I hope what I've tried to show you with all my cross-referencing is that God would have every believer seek to display all these qualities. As a believer, I should seek to be blameless, monogamous, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not brawling, not covetous, with my home in order. I want to get over being a baby Christian eventually, and I want a good testimony from the outside. That is a charge to every believer. You cannot say, well, I don't want to be an elder. <laughs> I'm going to order me another glass. <laughs> I don't want to be an elder. Don't ask me to house up anybody. Don't, I don't, I, that's not what I'm going to be. This is a call for everyone. Now, what I'm about to say next is even more, more important. This is a challenge to the men of every church. Every adult male should seek to qualify as a church leader. Can we read that together? Every adult male should seek to qualify as a church leader. And the church should seek to cultivate this type of leader. The men's ministry of the church should be the incubator for this type of leader. It's what, we, it's, it, it, it's what the goal is. So, two things I'm saying today is everyone should step up and try and be this person by God's grace. Secondly, by God's grace, this church will never be a church where the guys get to step back and the women get to step forward. We will always try to be a church where we push the men forward to lead. Now, I understand, guys, it's hard. Because for most men, leading is difficult because of the responsibilities involved in it. Number two, if you grew, how, many, how many of you grew up in the church? Been in church all your life, right? Who were all your Sunday school teachers? Women. So as a man, you think church is for who? Women. It ain't. It's for women and men. And men need to step up. Why? It's just so important that the church have incredible men of integrity to lead it. I close with this verse from Psalm 78, 70 and 72. God chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the nursing ooze, ooze, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With an upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his what? Skillful hand. Israel was blessed to have a leader like David in spite of his faults. The church is blessed when it has strong elders who take the oversight and are the pastors of its church. The church is blessed. That's not accidental. So may God help us to be a church that has an organization, but more importantly, a church that has a leadership structure and leaders who are seeking to be all that God called them to be. And may we be a church seeks to be all that we're supposed to be. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and the depths of the truths in it. Lord, we pray that you will take the things that we have 
looked at today. We pray that you will, you will, Lord, burn them into our hearts, burn them into our souls, help them to be so very, very true in our life. Thank you, Lord, for the men who lead this church. Thank you, Lord, for their efforts here. Thank you that they are men of integrity who love you, who seek to please you. May that just be, Lord, our mantra. And Lord, all of us, though, have a responsibility to live up to these things, these truths. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. But what about the deacons? What about the idea of a deaconess? Next Sunday. Yay. Oops, sorry. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, oh, what glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Jesus, draw me close, close Lord, to you. Let the world around me fade away. Oh, Jesus, draw me close. Close the Lord to you. For I desire to worship and obey. to worship and obey. As we close today, there'll be someone in the back with a bag if you have an offering. But I need to emphasize just a couple things. Our vacation is just around the corner. It's next Sunday after church from 2 to 6 at the Hillside Swim Club. You have to register, though, by either seeing someone today, the infamous Giselle, who will be back there, and you can sign up with her. The cost is $10 a person. It includes all the food that you can deal with. So you'll eat and eat. You'll be a bigger person for you, for, for it, and it'll be, you know, there's food in the house of the Lord today. So we encourage you to sign up for that. We want you to be part of that. Do you have a video on that? And then uh, in addition to that, uh, we have a membership and baptismal class coming up. If you want to be part of that, check the little thing on, over here and let us know. Um, if you want to be uh, part of anything we're doing, we have a special needs uh, social this coming Saturday. All of those we could use your help on and would appreciate your participation. Sam, did you have a video? Yes. Sam has a video. He's going to make an announcement about his men's meeting that's coming up. While he's doing that, uh, I'm going to leave. You're going to close in prayer. Sam, you're going to close in prayer for me? I guess you will. All right. Is the video ready? She's trying it. There it is. She's trying it. Here it comes. You know, sometimes we wrongly think fundamentals are only for beginners, but they're not. Fundamentals are behaviors we come back to time and time again. They equip us with a knowledge base that helps us to increase our proficiency and skill. And while we want to give them a pass, 
well, we should not pass them over because they actually make us better. In this series, we study eight topics that I believe are critical for men who actually want to launch out into a life of faith. We will look at four key topics that get men familiar with the Bible and four key themes critical to a man's faith. Join me, Vince Miller, for a study of the fundamentals for men. So thank you, Pastor, for that beautiful uh, insight from Scripture regarding men and ministry. Well, Pastor said to, to raise up able, young, incubating men. I have one right here. All right. This is Joshua Santana, and he's going to tell us about, quickly, briefly, about his experience in the last men's ministry, and what do you have to say to the young man here? Sure. Um, my name is Joshua Santana, like he said. Uh, the men's meetings, uh, it's awesome. For any young men that are here, um, you could be yourself, be surrounded by other great men who have great faith, and um, just tell your story, tell, tell everybody about what you're about, and just, just be encouraged by, by other men who have your back. So if anybody's interested, I would uh, recommend that you, um, you show up. Thank, thanks, Josh. Let's stand and close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you love your church and you didn't just leave your church to fend for itself and do what it feels like, Lord, but you've left your church to be effective, to be powerful, to reach the world, to reach this, this country, reach our neighborhoods, our communities, our families. Lord, we pray that we may trust and obey, follow you, Lord, so that we can be effective ministers of you to this generation. Lord, we thank you so much for your words. It was clear. Help us to embrace it and follow through. Be with us, Lord, and thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen.